Hello, everyone. This is Dark Journalist. Tonight, I have a special interview for you with the author of the Empire of the Wheel series, Walter Bosley. Walter has brought to light a mysterious group associated with the hidden exotic technology in the UFO file called NIMSA. Their origins were first revealed by a German immigrant artist named Charles Delschau, a member of the obscure Sonora Airship Club. The secrets of anti-gravity were held closely by this group, and their influence from deep state politics to UFO threat ops has been with us for centuries. Please join us now. Walter, it's great to have you back. Hey, good to be here. Been a while. Unbelievable. You've been doing incredible work. And, um, you know, all along the way, we've been following your NIMSA research. And now it's official, according to you, that you're actually putting out the NIMSA book this fall. Actually, in September. In September. It's coming right up. Yeah, I'm working on it like, like it's my main project I'm working on as we speak. Um, well, not as we speak, or you'd hear the typewriter clacking, but <laughs> everyone else does all day. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm currently working on it and it's uh, NIMSA, how America sold its soul, not lost, sold. And uh, oh, wow. it, uh, it's not enjoyable material to okay. say the least. So, well, you've touched on NIMSA as a thread throughout your books. It's in mm -hmm. Origins is the one where I really think you fleshed it out. Uh, it's in the Empire books as well. Why don't we start off with what is NIMSA? What's its connection to the advanced technology? And how far back does the airship aspect of NIMSA go? From my research, um, y it can be traced through... Um, history of engineering okay and 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 uh, pursuing the kinds of technologies that lead to what um charles delshaw described and um what actually was starting to be developed in the 20th century um you you can pull that thread back to the late 18th century but potentially it could go back um many thousands of years to the age of the Mahabharata and the Rama empire and oh, wow. things like that. Yeah. Uh, however, however, um, Charles Delshaw provides a very explicit and diagrammed um, a, a, a example or description of um, what the Sonora, the legendary Sonora Aero Club was, according to Delshaw, using to uh, power its flying machines in the 1850s. What's interesting is I was digging around uh, doing a report on the bell, okay, Daglaka, the Nazi bell, and its connections possibly to Sonora Air Club type of technology. And that's when I discovered the, um, uh, the, the Racine turbine. Okay, by McCorn Racine, he published his turbine design. He he was um, uh, one of the two guys who were the fathers of the study of thermodynamics. Okay, mm -hmm. in the 19th century, and he designed his um, turbine and published it, his system, his design in 1849. Okay, the year before, or you know, just the last year of the decade prior to when Del Shaw tells us the Sonora Aero Club was flying around. And here's the thing: it is virtually identical. I mean, when I say virtually, I mean it is identical, but there's one thing over here, and, and in the other one, it's over that kind of thing. But it is the same exact thing. Very human technology, very, you know, developed earthbound developed by, you know, one of the fathers of uh, thermodynamics. And I, uh, it convinced me that Peter Menace, the um, reported leader of the Sonora Aero Club, simply applied the Racine turbine 
to the arrows, the flying arrows. Uh Okay. That's what gave him the edge. Yeah. Yeah. And now remember, Delshaw said he had a, a secret fuel, a fuel with a secret, um, uh, recipe. Okay. That he didn't tell anybody the, the green stuff called the soup. Okay. And it looks to me like menace used his secret fuel in a racine turbine system to get the what the anti-gravity airborne properties mm-hmm. that del shall describes so when you have that in existence and that's a matter of history that's documented factual history this design of this racine turbine okay you can google it and you'll see it um that right there suggests that okay here now is where the sonora aero club got this system for 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 their propulsion for their their lift to power these um uh, flying machines these arrows so other groups could have done the same thing the 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 whoever's responsible for the 1890s airship mystery the same kind of you know, process just a little bit more advanced, right? And mm-hmm. when we go into the 20th century, again, that much more advanced. And certainly the German engineers and the German, you know, um, uh, scientists and stuff would have been fully aware of the Racine turbine, particularly right. if they were studying thermodynamics. So it looks to me like, all this to say, it looks to me like um, the Racine turbine is where this started and it was published in 1849 and i think german and american engineers ran with it the sonora aero club is supposed to be german immigrants peter menace was a german immigrant and as we know as i've talked about as you've talked about they have their connection to their sponsor the mysterious nimza all right so um, fascinating well walter if you there's a hundred years between that uh, particular patent in the bell. So we're talking about a century of missing development. Right. And the bell, remember, is a different device. Mm-hmm. Here, here's the thing. When you get to Delshaw and the Sonora Aero Club, you're into the 1850s. Another thing that was a modification to what I say was the adaptation of the Racine turbine. Another modification that they did was th- this this element that would rotate and spin. And um, uh, in Delshaw's drawings that he did in the late 19th century, claiming that this is what the Sonora Aero Club was using and doing, he essentially draws the bell, wow. thanks to Stephen Romano, of the Romano gallery who whose uh, gallery published this absolutely beautiful book. I don't know if you've seen it, the art of Del Shao. It's a yeah, big it's incredible. Coffee. Yeah. Amazing. That's the best book to see Del Shao's writings in these arrows. Well, in that we were looking and I pointed out to him, Hey, on page such and such, there's the bell. And as you recall, I copied that over and, yeah. and show that in origin. The, right. The, you know, and and I think also in um, Empire of the Wheel, two friends from Sonora, but definitely in Origin, and I've talked about it. And so um, that is the first instance of the bell. So when you have the Racine turbine, which um, uh, menaces uh, propulsion system, according to Delshaw, was, you know, were virtually identical. Okay, then you add the element of <laughs> whatever the bell, you know, is, was, You've got that there. Del Shell's claiming they were using that in the 1850s. So I argue that the Bell's origin, as we know it, is the Sonora Aero Club in the 1850s, as far as German development of it, mm-hmm. as far as German development. Um, but now, you could argue that that whole thing about the Bell, I point out in um, in a report I do, um, I did kind of a, a special report on the bell. Did it exist or not? You know, as such, um, on my Walter Bosley channel at YouTube, you, you can go through the video list and see it. Um, I show how the uh, ancient um, East Indian technology, you know, the Vimanas, shows yeah. uh, almost virtual, uh, you know, I, I, identical design to what 
the bell is and to what Del Shao claims that they used in the Sonora Aero Club flying machines. Mm -hmm. So, so it could have a pedigree of thousands of years old, but as far as what we can directly connect, you know, the Germans to, um, I see where it starts with the Sonora Aero Club and their bell. And then in the 1890s, remember, you have descriptions of the machinery and propulsion system, which also suggest that um, an advancement on the bell as Del Shao claimed was being used in the 1850s was also applied to the 1890s airship mystery. So there you had, oh my gosh, what, four or five decades of somebody playing with this and developing yeah. it before the Germans, excuse me, um, like seven decades. It's like 70 years between what Del Shao claims in the 1850s was an application of the bell device and what when we're told that Nazi Germany started messing with it. So they had, somebody had 70 years of Crow. development of this thing before we get to the 20th century. So a, a long way around the barn. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's fascinating. Isn't there a blueprint associated with this that looks like a uranium reactor as well? Um. I think so of the bell. Yeah. yeah. Of, of the, of the, when they get, when you get into the 20th century and you get into a serious discussion of the Nazi bell. Yeah. It starts looking like some other very real things. Interesting. Yeah. I think there's a picture in, in a feral book of mm -hmm. your stuff. And he said, he makes that comparison. I'm trying to think, I think it's one of oh. the breakaway civilization books. Oh, okay. But um, the whole idea of this technology existing before, let's take the UFO wave for a moment. Mm -hmm. You've got this whole line of history and of thinking saying 47, Kenneth Arnold, and that massive wave, the Roswell crash, all these things happen. There are all these anniversaries this summer mm -hmm. about this. Yeah. And we just went through 75th, 76th anniversary of a number of these. Right. And, um, but in fact... If you peer in a little bit deeper using the type of lens that you're going into this with, mm -hmm. you're finding the airship mystery, et cetera, going back into the 19th century. And, you know, recently we did an episode on the Cosmos Club, which is something of a deep study in this. But the Cosmos Club people show up around that airship mystery. What's the connection there? And how far back and secret does this technology have to be kept in the 19th century well we're we're, we're talking um one of our favorite guys in american history colonel samuel tillman tillman and um you know i stumbled into this by you know samuel tillman with amos dolbear are named as crew members identifying themselves as tillman and dolbear Amazing. right we know this in yeah. the 1890s you know it's in one of the newspaper accounts and so i did what you do right you uh, you look at the newspaper account and you say okay was there really a tillman and a dolbear so i jumped in and i'm like oh my <laughs> there really were and and here's the funny thing it's not like they were um uh uh, uh stephen hawking and carl sagan popularly famous scientist guys right. okay these guys weren't rock stars of their time okay they were uh, you know one was a military nerd and the other one was a, a civilian nerd okay so who would if they were faking it use those names so i'm i'm in the camp that there was some type of thing that somebody you know the airship account is true and that was Colonel Tillman and Dolbear. And then in looking at Tillman is how I learned about this thing called the Cosmos Club. Right. And I only took it as far as the things they were into and then really got into Tillman as far as the extent of would he been have been the kind of guy that would have been involved with airships? And absolutely, as you know, his background, he, you know, the chemistry, the, the cartography, the, you know, everything. And um, I got to say, I love how far you have taken, pulled the Cosmos Club thread because, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. That makes, I mean, I was just listening the other, the other night about um, John Wesley and <laughs> there, I'm still learning. So like, whoa, I didn't know that. <laughs> so uh, Tillman um, was a U.S. Army officer and uh, uh, he was, he was a scientist officer. He was an s &T guy. And, um, the, the, the span of his career was perfect and identical for what I argue is development of secret, um, airship technology from the post-Civil War era 
up into the 1890s. <laughs> and um, so it's it's really just a perfect match. And it's incredible. he's the right guy. And so that right there, I thought, was a big, um, big plus for those of us arguing that the airship mystery was really airships and not some of the ridiculous things that people and and that it wasn't also an april fool's hoax by newspaper <laughs> oh come on yeah. <laughs> you know unbelievable I, now do you think the fact that they mention tillman in the article mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. this is like possibly they were going to reveal the technology they were going to roll out hey we have flight and then it, there was just a kibosh on it and you get the wright brothers five years later who are living at the cosmos club <laughs> that um if I if I heard you say that before, I didn't remember it. It's like oh, they're living at the. <laughs> what more? What more could anyone ask? Um, uh, what's interesting about yeah the the idea that they were about to reveal this stuff and then the kibosh on it. Um, Todd Wood and I are have been we've done two volumes of a series of books which we call the Lost Future series. Now, what do we mean by that? We're of the mind that some group you know, some powers, elites or whatever, um, in the late 19th century decided to usurp the coming century. In other words, we were headed into a very different 20th century, a very different world, a better one, likely mm -hmm. a better one. And somebody on the level of the elites decided otherwise. And that's why we ended up with the 20th century we got where a, a push towards certain type of industrialization, a push for a uh, constant war, right? The yeah. whole idea of the, the emergence of the modern military industrial complex. And um, they decided that, nah, you're not going to get people of the world. You, we're in control now and you're going to get a different 20th century. And that's what we mean by the lost future. So yeah, the idea that um, this kind of technology was maybe on the cusp of being revealed to the public, you know, to the world, um, and then yanked from our hands. It makes sense because I think these airships were real, but where was this technology during World War I even? Um, yeah. why, why did we suddenly get uh, pushed um, you know, into uh, these ridiculous little gliders. I mean, how many feet did the right flyer fly and they were all popping champagne and, you know, they get the credit for this. Oh, how brilliant, you know, like, okay. <laughs> but there were brilliant things being done, you know, before that. And some argue that I can never remember his name. It, there was a film starring Glenn Ford, the guy that was in San Diego, um, maybe the decade before the Wright brothers. And he had, um, like Montgomery, yeah, you know, all um, right, like Kearney Mesa or something is where I live, but I can never. I think it was Glenn Ford. It was one of those earnest, you know, right. good guy type of actors yeah. playing him. But um, you know, that guy is someone that I never heard of until I saw that movie on mm -hmm. TCM. I'm like, what? Well, what's this? Yeah. You know, so that's what. It, so Fair exactly hand. what you're what you're so talking about is the yeah. you know the 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 uh, usurpation of uh, the 20th century. You know, that's a great way to put it. And there's a real dark side that you pursue on the whole NIMSA mm. front, which is the extent to which it invades the whole American Democratic yeah. Republic. Yeah, yeah. Um, I. Joseph Farrell, our friend, Dr. Farrell had, uh, I, I was going to do this NIMSA thing a few years back. And so he recommended a couple of books that I look at that I'd never heard of. And the first one I looked at just shocked me. I, it, it shocked me. And it was like, you know, the veil was lifted. It, it the history of the United States after World War II made complete sense within the context of this. And it was also depressing. It was, whoa, whoa what, what do I do with this? I don't, I don't know how to deal with this right now. So I put it aside. And it was a video series I was doing, actually, on my, on my YouTube. So mm -hmm. I put it aside. And then um, I think it was late last year, earlier this year, I decided... No, I need to do this book. 
people really need to know this. And, and um, so I dove into the two sources, um, some of the most, uh, from the perspective of what we're talking about, some of the most depressing material I've ever read. Um, so I decided, okay, um, I got to do this book. And, and essentially what I'm going to hopefully uh, prove, you know, or definitely argue in the book is that the United States was um, invaded, overtaken and conquered through Operation Paperclip. When you, learn, when you learn the real details, the history of Operation Paperclip, when you see um, how I'm going to lay it out, and this isn't originating with me, this is other sources and this is looking at the history, but I'm going to lay out how this was their plan all along, something like this. And it totally fits within the modus operandi of how the Prussian culture in Germany has done things for a long time. It, it just, it fits the pattern. And what's really depressing about it is how, you know, um, in the, in, in, in the, the excitement of the glory of, you know, world war two, we emerge as, you know, the big power that we are yeah. big heroes of world war two. Um, we were stirred up immediately into the cold war, you know, not that the Soviet, the Soviet union, don't get me wrong, folks, the Soviet Union was terrible. It was <laughs> awful. They they were every bit as murderous as Hitler's Germany. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, and so we did have to be concerned about them. But what was done to us was we we basically gladly sold our souls in the name of defense. So um, we went about that in guided by nefarious intentions and yes. um it's shocking how what's happened to the united states um uh um, industrially militarily politically and even culturally all fits with what i'm going to lay out which is a modus operandi that's very old and um it all fits and it's the only thing that makes sense you know in other words joseph Farrell has been telling us about the Nazi international all these years and folks, he's right. Mm -hmm. Um, so I know I'm going to get some, you know, Oh God, there's Bosley, you know, and that quoting Farrell again, but <laughs> Hey, sorry guys. No, there's uh, a, there is a weird, uh, there's a knee jerk reaction against the Nazi exploration. Mm -hmm. They're like, mm -hmm. well, the Nazis were in world war two and you know, that's where it uh, ended. Oh, don't be, yeah, right. yeah, they're, they're like, uh, it's, it's an interesting piece i think in all this that when you get to something as hardcore in changing the system as the jfk assassination mm -hmm. that the researchers who do it the deep state researchers who do it professionally don't mention the nazi aspect at all yeah isn't that weird jfk assassination and other assassinations and everything i'm gonna point out okay uh, it's all right out of a playbook that it has been used for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is why this is so interesting to me also, because if you get around the JFK part with NIMSA, you're going to cut right into those corners of NASA and this kind of like secondary space program being yeah. built up over there that he's trying to get control of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's that's explosive because for me that's part of the reason of covering up the whole thing to the level that it's been covered up. Yeah, because you still you have a massive aerospace presence in the middle of all. Of it. Sure, sure, yeah, a absolutely. And and remember, Nimza uh, from the Delshaw perspective. Remember Delshaw's touchstone with them, his experience of the elephant that you know is this mysterious German thing was Nimza. The organization that, um, from his perspective and experience, was the flight, okay, the exotic technology, right? Right. So, um, to me, absolutely, I see that when they decided to, to take over, to become a parasite in the United States and take it over from within, it was because we were the big power on the block now, because we had the resources, because they could use us and our science and technology and our resources, okay? Um, and, and they could use all that 
to flesh out their own ideas that they'd had for decades, you know, in um, many cases. And um, so it's, it should be no surprise that we suspect classified, you know, space program activities going on, secret space program stuff, because right. this is what they wanted. You know, they, mm -hmm. they were always obsessed with, you know, first it was flight. Then it was, you know, getting off the planet, basically, I think, to see what and who is out there. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting, because it brings us into the whole Musk question and the SpaceX, you know, mm -hmm. DARPA connection and all that. And then the the kind of resources that are already available to them in space mm -hmm. that uh, we haven't gone back to the moon since 1972. <laughs> so it puts us in a weird position of 50 years of missing development again. If that's the case, um, you know me, I, I think that if, that they find a way to do things secretly Yes, and for whatever reason, um, you know, I, I don't know if it was when you get into the, um, the, the resources, the industrial, um, potential, right. You know, mineral resources, that kind of thing, claiming mm -hmm. all of that. I don't know if that's what put the lid clamp the lid on no more public exposure you know so close to the moon let them see it every night they can't really see anything um or if it was encountering some one else up there I, right. I, I don't know exactly but um i don't think we stopped sending things to the moon Exactly. Uh, you know, I've always wanted to ask you this since we're talking about the moon and I don't think people ask you enough about, because a lot of your ideas around the moon are very interesting. Do you think we went there before we went there? Yes. Yeah. I, I, to, to me, for very practical reasons, the whole Apollo program, public Apollo program was a dog and pony show, cold war dog and pony show. Okay. And, uh, I argue that they weren't really going to do this for the first time in front of the eyes of the world the way Apollo 11 was done. Right. Because they want it. Now, don't get me wrong. People get there. Uh, I, I heard this phrase um, the other day, this, this vet bro culture. You know, you get <laughs> these guys that, you know, hey, I, when I was a little kid, I watched all the Apollo landings and stuff too. These guys are heroes of mine, okay? So yeah. vet, vet bros, calm down. Because I'm not saying that Apollo 11 wasn't real. I think the people who say we didn't go, we faked it, are fools. Um, and I'm not saying it wasn't just as dangerous and risky for Apollo 11, 11 to go. Okay, I'm saying that because of that, they would rather know that it could be done rather mm -hmm. than, hey, let's trot out the very first time we try this. We're not sure it'll work. Let's do it in front of the world in a Cold War. <laughs> I don't think so. It's my belief that um, they did it. They did a landing secretly before they did Apollo 11. And when you look at the demeanor of the astronauts afterwards, like, like think about it. You're supposed to be the very first human being in known history to step foot on the moon, and you're going to be an aw shucks shy guy not doing parades, not being public the way Neil Armstrong was. I yeah. don't care how aw shucks you are. You know, you're going to, you're going to go out and go, Oh golly, it was nothing folks. And you're going to let yourself be celebrated. In fact, you're going to do it because the public demands it. You know, you are this amazing human. Well, I argue that it's because he knew those guys knew they weren't the first, they were good soldiers, good, you know, employees. And they went along with it because, you know, it was just the way it was being done. Yeah, um, yeah, but uh, my Absolutely. understanding is one of the pre I think it was Apollo 10 was the one that practiced the close pass. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it, it, it could have been either Apollo 10 or it could have been a completely secret mission. But I argue that they tested it to make sure that whole thing could work before they did Apollo 11. Absolutely fascinating. Um you know, this really gets to it, too, because it's like there's a parallel history running side by side mm -hmm. with the normal history. And when you dig yeah. into that, you uh, you can find traces of it. In your work, you can track it incredibly well. Unfortunately, there's, there's a large disinfo mob around Apollo and mm -hmm. around Flat Earth and this kind of thing. And uh, it's interesting because it says once you start thinking outside of the official picture – you have to be in one of these camps, but it's absolutely incorrect. Right. Right. And, and 
Um, it's interesting. I would say if you're questioning the official narrative and you're wondering which camp you want to be in for a while and explore, consider the one that even the other camps don't want you talking about <laughs> like the flat earthers. No, no, no. It's, it, it's, it's our thing. And then this, that, and the other, um, it, it's kind of like Joseph Farrell again with the Nazi international. There's yeah. people out there that just vehemently, they want it to be anything but that. Mm -hmm. and so you got to wonder, Hmm, he thinks they do protest too much and it, it could be the same thing. What are the other, you know, options mm -hmm. um, that could explain this that are being ignored. And I say, that's the one to explore our Greg Bishop, who, you know, well, also, he oh, yeah. said something years ago that I've always liked. And he said that, uh, if you have a UFO experience and the, you see this UFO right in front of your eyes and you're just dazzled, he says, turn around and look behind you to see what's there that maybe that UFO is distracting you from. Interesting. So <laughs> I like that. Great. It's kind of just great as a metaphor. Honestly. All right. Yeah. When <laughs> you know, I, when I had my UFO experience, I did that. I was like, Oh, Greg says, look behind it. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of people remember you and your, the start of your work from your appearance in Mirage men. Uh, <laughs> I, I had actually, yeah, I had been around on Greg's show for what, a, a, like a couple of years Yeah, when I was asked to, when he said, Hey, these guys, and I'm like, yeah, okay. And, um, I hadn't even come out with the Disneyland book yet. Wow. So yeah, I was amazing. Uh, it's, it's a real trip through history to be. And that's like, you know, what's one of those high points that comes up that documentary. And then there you are right in the middle of it. When you look at that, there's a curve there. Uh, I forget the year that that came out, but we're looking at about two decades of development around the independent alternative research side. And now we have this UFO Inc. thing going on, you know, yeah. copyright UFO picture. It's Jeremy Corbell's picture. It's a Tic Tac mm -hmm. UFO copyright yeah. trademark. And uh, this is this kind of privatization of the whole idea of the UFO thing. Where do you think we are 20 years later with this? Um, that being used to control, um, access to legitimate UFO evidence and data. I, I think, um, the, 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 they tested, somebody tested that with, if you recall, I can never remember this guy's name, but NASA oddly, um, contracted a civilian and he came away with ownership of, photographs having to do you know taken during the space program in other right. words taxpayers paid for the machinery taxpayers paid for the mission taxpayers paid for the medium in which these photos were snapped but the civilian owns the rights and access to them wow. and i remember people were really questioning that going you know what's up with this and then you had if you recall um what about, uh, I can't believe it's eight years, you know, since Corey Good emerged, but a few years ago, oh. I think three years ago or whatever, um, Corey Good tries this, uh, copywriting, just the fret wanting, putting in for a copyright to control SSP and. Secret oh yeah. Space yeah, yeah. Yeah. Basic terms like, right. you know, somebody would copyright UFO, the term yeah. UFO. Corporate and, trademark. Yeah. So I think that, um, if they don't do it themselves, test the waters themselves, they pay close attention to other people testing those waters to see if they succeed at it, to give them a legal precedence to come in oh, and right. then control it. So I think that they saw Corey good. They kind of rolled their eyes, shake their heads because they know what he was about a bunch of nonsense. And that didn't go far. That didn't fly. But right. now Jeremy Corbell is doing this and just doing it and only you know people like us are the ones pointing out hey wait a minute that he doesn't own the object and he and, and i guess he does this on footage other people have taken so um yeah. i think it is a trend that we're going to see continue people are going to be throwing that spaghetti on the wall to see you know if they can make it stick and the first instance where someone is allowed to do that then Absolutely. I think that's going to be the precedent. And the, the whole idea is then to control the real photos, the, the photos where it's a real one. 
mm-hmm. and they can control our access. So, cause, cause as you, you know, it's all about controlling the narrative. They've been doing that for a long time. There's no question about it. And um, the research that you do mm-hmm. over and over again, you know, it opens up areas because when we get into the disclosures that we're hearing, for example, the stuff that came forward with Grush, which was mm-hmm. pushed over the top by this site, the debrief and yeah. you know, Russ Colehart with like, you're the first person from the government who's ever come forward and said this. I was like, Where, where's this guy been? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Oh, well there you bring up. Yeah. You bring up another problem. I, I argue that Colt Hart knows better than to have said something like that, but ah. here's, here's the problem. It feeds this, um, we have an epidemic problem in the ufology community specifically since 2017. And Mm -hmm. that is the mass of newbies, the news who know nothing about ufology history and they don't care. Mm -hmm. Um, This is why Bob Lazar is being taken seriously again because Corbell knows who to play that nonsense too right. and um colt Hart is playing to the same level of ignorance you no know, question those of us who've been around for years we saw grush coming from two miles away mm-hmm. uh, you know he's nonsense he's full of crap but it's remembered they're pushing this to the noobs right so they've completely bypassed anyone who actually knows anything. <laughs> oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. sure. And, and the other thing they're doing is they're recycling, you know, old yes. stories that doesn't matter to what level they've been debunked. They're right. just recycling, but they're, they're doing something extra now. They're doing saturation. In other mm-hmm. words, we don't just get Lou Elizondo. We get Lou and the CIA group. Okay. We yeah. don't just get him but we get um uh we get grush and as soon as you debunk lou you know as soon as you debunk lou someone um who who was the other guy um gary uh, nolan well there was gary nolan but then there was the cia guy the older cia guy uh uh, uh, is one of them ramirez ramirez yes Yes. i'm sorry yeah um there was ramirez and as soon as people say eh no ramirez then you get that someone else came along and then grush (laughs) see what they're doing is they're just they're hitting us with rapid fire to wear us down and and they don't care that these guys are out there the new flavor of the week they get debunked here comes another one and the thing is the noobs are just overwhelmed because remember a lot of them are of that um, short attention span generation. Mm -hmm. So there's another reason why they know nothing about the history. They can't pay attention to reading, you know, a couple of books or or watching a really good documentary for more than five minutes or two pages because they're, their attention spans. This is the way they've been, you're getting in, See, you're getting back into what I and many others are talking about that the Operation Paper Nazis did to our society and our culture. They bred that generation. They right, this is the social engineering. Yeah. Yeah, this is the social engineering. And and this is the reward and the benefit that the um deep state gets is because you know, I'm older than you. We're both getting older, we're gonna age out. So mm-hmm. they're playing to the up and coming generation that will not question, you know, they're, they're, they're because they want to believe. Oh, yeah. So they're not going to yeah. question like we do. No, I mean, that main line of UFO people, they're mm-hmm. either dead or in their eighties practically. Yeah. And then there's this other wave of people who've investigated the thing, say like the work that you've done, the work that Farrell's done. And you're right. All they have to do is kind of wait that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's unfortunate when some of the, you know, the old guard sells out the way they do too. Yes. I mean, we've, people who we know or are acquainted with personally, who's, who started out doing great work, have just ended up, you know, it's kind of sad with the direction they took and the stuff they bought into. And, and, and it is, it is because you know. their, their whole work was based on the fact that the government was keeping something from them. And then they started yeah. like, Hey, government disclosure, the CIA loves us, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, that is outrageous in a sense. And if you compare some of them with the work that they were doing five, 10 years ago, it's totally yeah. strange. It's almost like invasion of the body snatchers. Well, look, look at, let, let's look at Jacques Vallée. In my opinion, his best work um, stopped after the early 90s. Yes. Oh, yeah. 
his most important work. And Absolutely, yeah. those were the years up until then, he would look at stuff other than the ET hypothesis, which right. is what they always want to. And again, you know me, I, I totally accept, I, of course, ETs exist. My gosh, it's a huge, of course, there's going to be intelligent life out there. And yeah, they have come here. And I think they do come here. It's mm -hmm. just that they don't explain the majority of sighting. They don't explain everything that's going on. Right. Okay. Um, the, the problem ET narrative is the one that, nope, that's the explanation for all of it. Don't think about these other things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so talking about valet, that's unfortunately the direction he embraced ironically, but I recommend people really go back and look at the stuff he was doing in the seventies, eighties, and into the early nineties, passport to Magonia, the revelations, confrontations, that, that kind of stuff. Oh, it's much and, deeper of and, work. Yeah. Yeah. And he's just one example, you know, mm -hmm. of, of what we're talking about. So, um, no, it's shocking. And I think that that's part of a, a program over time of watering mm -hmm. down the stuff and getting it to fit this narrative that's coming in. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting with Grush. And, uh, I mentioned to you that I have a pipeline over to Burchett and I've been trying to get some material to him. One of the things that he's the only person I think in that whole congressional setup who, who actually wants to get to the bottom of things. But I also feel that he's being naive, taking Grush uh, so seriously. One of the things that I've noticed that he's done is he said, well, Grush was in the military. He would know. And uh, I want to point this out, which is you have a military background and, you know, you were also in the, <laughs> the special uh, office of the air force, AFOSI, mm -hmm. So you know something about how these types of ops run. Uh, so could you say, if this was a direct message from us to Representative Tim Burchett, could you tell him that Grush potentially could be running some kind of an operation? Or he he could be, he could be, yeah, the, somebody's running an operation and he's the asset that they're right. using, you know, at the moment. Um, it, it, first of all, it starts with, oh, this person's in the military. They're of high virtue. Um, folks. Um, I and, and others who have been special agents in military investigative agencies, um, a, a lot of part of what they do is to investigate military members who are criminals, who are com <laughs> willfully, intentionally being dishonest, lying, stealing, uh, committing crimes. OK, that's the ugly side of it. It's just like the world on the outside. You, you know, not everybody is of high virtue okay um so you have to take them on an individual basis now the operational side of it absolutely um the congressman's being uh a little naive just to take grush's word at face value because if he were to study just the history of you know intelligence operations okay particularly perception management operations double agent operations i think he would have a different view of characters like grush um, because anybody who's been in that world immediately sees the signs and the red flags that grush is is totally just spouting a script right. and the body language guys who are civilian well one of them oh I yeah think, d does uh, uh has been involved with intelligence ops and military and stuff but those four guys i can never remember that what their names are and stuff, but they did a fantastic, each one of them did an independent body language analysis and all four of them came away unanimous that, yeah, this guy, this is a false narrative. He, he's willfully, you know, like he's been instructed to do this. Yes. And, you know. That's incredible. I mean, they, first of all, getting those guys unanimous, I think is rare enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, I think with that background and, you know, I think when you look at these things with your own trained military background, you can mm -hmm. see someone like Grush and you can look at him and say and listen to what he's saying and say like, oh, well, he could be being, you know, put out there for this particular purpose. Sure. Yeah. And and remember, folks, that doesn't make him necessarily a bad guy because from his perspective, he might believe the narrative he, he could have every reason as you know an intelligence um officer you know in the military he could have very good reason for 
believing what he's being told, not questioning what his superiors and his colleagues and the, the files that are put in front of him, the, the briefings that he's getting. Uh, so in his view, whatever um, the reason for the operation that he's told it is, um, he could be going into this not with the intention of telling an evil, rotten lie and, and duping the American people and deceiving them. It, it could be that um, he feels like he's serving some you know, national security cause. I right. get that. Um, I, of course, am someone like you who has crossed a threshold where, no, <laughs> I'm yeah. still going to question, you know, <laughs> I'm still going to question, okay, I was, it was shown me in a briefing, but, you know, do I have any reason to think they left something out? Case right. in point, when I got my when I first got into the Air Force and and first reported to my OSI detachment, and I had to go get my briefings, my official briefings, so I could, you know, I I came to the Air Force with a a a, a bunch of you know access, and I had a clearance level with the FBI, this, that, and the other. It was TSSCI already, mm -hmm. but you get your tickets; those are your different levels of security classification. So I had to go over to the vault and or the the, I'm sorry, the, the Intel unit, not the vault. Um, in that case, I had to go over to the Intel unit and get my briefings so that, you know, I officially was briefed in up to my ticket level. And, uh, and I won't tell you how many I got. That's not prudent. Um, but, um, I came away from that and have thought for years, um, that the interesting way in which they gave you what they were giving you and showing what they were showing you was such a certain aspect of it was such that that in the course of your duties, of course, if you got exposed to certain secrets and stuff, it actually could fit within what they briefed. If people think that you go, when you get your security levels, you, you get a briefing on specifics of programs and stuff like that. That's not how it works. You, you get this briefing that says, okay, now at your level, you're you're going to be aware of assets up to this level. And this is how some of it works. And, and some of it had to do with space-based stuff. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But th what it is, is because you're going to be exposed to specific classified programs where you are going to learn the technical details, okay, and the mission specifics. And, and you see, oh, that's what they were talking about when they vaguely oh referred God. to this thing in orbit. They were talking about this stuff right. kind, of, kind of thing. And so um, uh, still there's this margin for, you have to acknowledge they, they could tell you anything they want because mm -hmm. you're going to, you're going to trust them, right? You're right. This is your job. You're, you know, you're all sort of, and, and, and so, when you think about that, particularly after you get out and you're looking at other things, you could see how the threat narrative could be so believed by everybody, you know, who's on active duty. I, my views on it changed over time, you know, mm -hmm. just in, in recent years, you right. know, um, I, because I see how they're working that. Yeah. And you know me, my position is I don't think that we're never going to encounter a threat from space. Right. You know, yeah. that, that that's naive and foolish. What I do think is you right there, absolutely spinning us up under the threat narrative and, and people rightfully point to the, you know, the, the war on terror era, right. Yeah. They constantly had us in a state, well, yeah. it, you know, a state of it's this level, it's that level. They're around every corner, the paranoia. So that's what they're working on. That mm -hmm. they're using the space threat narrative now, I think, um, to work us up into a state of paranoia where we'll just nod and agree to anything they want to do operationally Absolutely. down the road. You know, so yeah, yeah, I'm not the first to say this, but um, when you're still on active duty, for example, working in that world, and you're just coming off, like Grush has only been out how long, right? Didn't he? Just, not very long. Yeah, he, not very he, long. Yeah. So he, it's it's more easy for him to believe mm -hmm. that that perspective is gospel. And oh my gosh, they would never. Because you do know secret things that the public doesn't know about. You do know about when threats... I'll tell you right now, when I was in LA, 
Um, there was twice that I got one was a phone call from my direct supervisor. Um, uh, uh, she, she was chief of the branch I worked for when, and she said, um, need you to come in the office, went in the office. And, but this happened on two occasions over the course of two years where I and another agent got pulled in and told, Hey, um, we're pulling your deployment bags. We might be having you on a plane to Korea because sabers are rattling bad enough from North Korea that we might, there might be an air force response and you and so-and-so will be our agents over there from oh, wow. our detachment. And yet that was not to be mentioned publicly. Mm -hmm. I was allowed to tell my wife because she worked for FBI and had a TS clearance. And at the time was on a counterintelligence guy, you know, so I could tell her cause we have a ki kid. It's like, Hey, I might have to deploy, but this is, you know, that happened twice. Wow. And the public never knew about it. Incredible. It didn't. So that's an example of what we're talking about, how you, there are real world things that go on that the public never hears about. And, and so of course you, you, what does that do? That builds trust because you've lived it, you've experienced it. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot easier for them to tell you, Hey there airman or Hey there captain or Hey there special agent. Um, uh, there's a threat coming from Ganymede and uh, the people don't know it, you know? Ah. And so before, you know, a lot of people just want to throw the baby out the bathwater, condemn the military people who are part of that apparatus without thinking that to some extent they can be duped totally too. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's giving, it's almost like giving them plausible deniability yes. Yes. because it's like, Hey, I came out, you know, because I heard this. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing that we know about Grush is he doesn't claim to have actually seen anything. It's everything <laughs> is referral, right? That's where and, his thing falls apart, I think. Yeah, he has some great answers for for yeah. tap dancing, as you call it. You know, yeah. they say, "Well, are there dead aliens associated with these UFO crash retrievals?" And he's like, yeah. "Well, sometimes when things crash, you find pilots." Yeah, isn't that interesting? <laughs> pilots, pilots. You know. <laughs> What do you uh, make of the language, uh, beside the body language, just the actual vocabulary that this guy's laying out there? I think he's just filling a gap. Um, I think whatever, if it if it is what we suspect, that it's an assignment, I think he's filling a gap between who, you know, the, the, the storyteller before him that they're putting out there and then the next one that they're going to throw at us. Because I really do think... There's more they're to doing a, a rapid fire. Oh yeah. They're just going to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And, um, it, you know, because that's, what's going to get the attention. Um, so they just, they figured out how to keep the, the media spotlight on their narrative. And that's just by one right after the other, you know, mm -hmm. and think about it when you got people like Joe Rogan, helping them by, by oh, yeah. giving Bob Lazar legitimacy. Like Joe. <laughs> I, they don't I have any screening at all. You know, someone no. asked me, what's your favorite Rogan show? And I said, he's never done a UFO show. In fact, you know, he's done shows about UFOs that are just these unvetted, you know, let Christopher Mellon from the intelligence yeah. operations come in and talk about it. Joe, right? Joe Rogan is a shrewd businessman in what he does. Yes. You know, oh, he's yeah. a master at what he does and he's a very sharp businessman, but he's not too swift if he's, really honestly trying to get give us legitimate sources and information and and he he you're right he did no background on lazar and um that's know. incredible i mean it is it's very interesting because even a half inch deep uh you know <laughs> touring of some of yeah. that stuff would throw it out but 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 look what happens i mean um and i i bring this up every time i'm on every opportunity i get go back and find that video where corbell is on a debate stage with stanton friedman and look at what a disgusting trolling unprofessional um Oh yeah, -hole that C Corbell was in a public forum to Stanton Friedman. It was all this trolling ad hominem, you know, bro douchery, you mm -hmm. know. And of course, the other, you know, bros out there. All right, dude. All right. These are the same people that you know that are cheering yeah. on Rogan, bringing Lazarn. Yeah. And this is what they do: is a naysayer comes out intelligently and points out, "Hey, wait a minute." This is nonsense. They get they they get bro beat, 
and 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 they get trolled right. and some of the trolls are it's an organized thing I'm yeah in that oh, yeah. school of thought too there are bots involved as well <laughs> Yeah, I, I just got it recently. Okay. Oh, really? I, I did. <laughs> I went and saw because all the bad stuff we were hearing about the Indiana Jones movie, the new one, right? Oh, so yeah. it got to it got to the point where I've seen all of them in the theater. I wasn't going to not see this one. I went to it. It is a deeply flawed movie in, in parts. It's an hour too long. There's a section of it. The second section of the movie goes on way too long. And if the whole movie were that I would have hated it too. Because it's just, a, it's an awful, just, ugh, and you're glad that it's over. But after it's over, and you, and, you know, I watched the rest of the movie. And so I did a review, you mm -hmm. know, because I do pop culture stuff on my channel. I did a review in which I said, hey, just what I said. I go, it's a very flawed movie. Um, Phoebe Waller-Bridge's character is annoying as hell. She, you just don't like her at all. Mm -hmm. But I acknowledged this movie is not as bad as the haters are saying and her character goes through a store, a, a dramatic arc. And, and, it, you know, I don't hate this movie again. It's flawed. Yes. It, you can see where they changed what they changed because they knew the audience, you know, and on and so forth. It's a flawed movie. Okay. My viewers loved it. I had three guys come out of nowhere who I'd never heard of before behind screen names, just coming at me. Wow. Telling me I was going to lose view subscribers and, and <laughs> I'm a woke lefty, <laughs> you know, and, and all this stuff. And, oh yeah, you and your Hollywood friends and all this. And, and I'm like, oh, it's your zip code, Walter. That's yeah. yeah. Just piss off. You know, it, it's, it's it, because I don't tolerate trolls who hide behind screen names. I'm sorry. Oh yeah. You yeah. know, show me uh, my real names out there. My yeah. face is out here. Yeah. Show me yours. And they never do. But what? But that's an example. Exactly. They would just, you know, hit to try to intimidate. And It's organized. It's yeah. interesting. Um, when you get around the UFO thing, you see some of these accounts pop up almost immediately as soon mm -hmm. as you put out something against mm -hmm. one of their heroes, you know, mm -hmm. Grush or, or one of these guys. And they're there immediately saying like, He's risked his life, you know, he's putting his <laughs> oh, life yeah. on the line. <laughs> Those are the vet bros. Those are the vet bros. There's a guy that um, he's a veteran himself, infantryman, and he's a fan of Band of Brothers. And he does this TikTok thing. <laughs> and he goes through and he tells you the real stories of the guys who are depicted in the series. He even tells you where they got it wrong or they purposely painted the guy like a villain unfairly because that's how the public is going to think of this guy who's a veteran of normandy or, or what have you and this guy tells you the true story you know and and i agree with him doing it and that's where i learned the term vet bros because he gets the vet bro oh dude these are heroes man it's it's you know no one um uh, uh you know no one's questioning whatever they might have done in you know combat or dangerous situations or whatever exactly but, it doesn't mean that they're being honest about their UFO narrative. Well, this brings us right back to the Birchett thing because yeah. Birchett said, well, there's only two possibilities. Uh -huh. You know, we have these honorable military guys telling us the truth about these UFOs or they're crazy. And some of our leading military people are crazy. That's it. No, that's not. There's a third option, which is they're part of an operation and they're being put out there under some kind of counterintelligence narrative. Yeah. Well, these guys, I think, think about it. I see a scenario where he might've been, you know, going to say that. And somebody said, Oh no, you won't go there. We, we don't know. Uh, you know? Um, because, right, right. you know, I, I could see that being done. Mm -hmm. uh, they play hardball, you know, with that stuff. And, um, somebody, somebody, I think, I think a certain aspect of whatever this agenda is got involved with our community because mm -hmm. of those legitimate, partially because of those legitimate SSP conferences. Right. You, know, right. you, you, you were at 2015, you know? Yes. Um, I, I've said this before. I've said it here. That whole group was getting a little too close to the real truth. And so the spotlight had to be yanked off of them. And I think that's why the storytellers like Corey Good and stuff were encouraged and emerged. And it wasn't that Corey Good was some, you know, some 
intelligence asset he was so brilliant no what it was is there were idiots and liars out there and oh, yeah. i think i think the assets okay take a popular say radio show in our community okay mm -hmm. take a popular radio show you can think of one i'm sure right that's on every night um there could be all it takes is one person on the executive or production staff who makes decisions about guests, all it takes is one of the one person to be, um, you know, a contact, a an associate of someone in an intelligence agency who has influence, and th the influence could be, hey, if you you really want to have people on that's talking about you know the inside skinny on what's really going on with this stuff, you might want to have that guy and that guy over there you know, right. these, these guys over here you know Farrell and fitz and paul lavillette and etc that they don't know but mm -hmm. but but good and you know this Corey good guy you might want to you know start talking to him more and and it, it can be as subtle as that or it can mm -hmm. be start focusing on them and, and get the light off of these guys anywhere on that spectrum that's how it works okay mm -hmm. so i really do think that somebody in the, you know, the the deep state military industrial complex that has the stake that's doing all this false narrative stuff, I think they had some hand in the shift um, from, in the SSP discussion in our community, the shift from the legitimate researchers who were speaking at these events in question to the Corey Goods and the Randy Kramers and, and right. Andrew Beth and all these other baloney stories. The inner Earth Princess gave me the technology. All, all, yeah, all, all this crap. <laughs> I think they had a hand. And then, and then the objective of that was to discredit the discussion of SSP. And right. once they successfully had made that look like buffoonery, mm -hmm. uh, uh, let's introduce Lou Elizondo and the boys. Right. Okay. So then again, what are we doing? We're again, moving even farther away from a discussion on classified Mm -hmm. space program ops okay mm -hmm. we're focusing on it couldn't possibly be ours and then and and meanwhile they're doing all this to camouflage classified space technology right that's what yeah. this is all because that's what the tic tac was is classified military technology they knew darn well what that was yes uh, you know and now it's been proven that what what was the latest thing that it, maybe i'm getting confused with something else but it was only going f actually 40 miles an hour yeah, go fast video. Yeah, <laughs> fast. that thing's only going forty miles an hour. Yeah, I went. You know, I went. Said that I went faster than that over to my ATM this morning. To my bank, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, but it, it took five years to unravel that hoax. And, and what that did was that diverted, you know, as much attention as possible for those five years. So right. then they, you know, and folks, that's what's going on here. Mm -hmm. You know, is um, they're diverting. Just one diversion after another, and and they're doing something they've never done before. It's this rapid fire. It doesn't matter that you don't trust these guys five minutes after you hear them talking, because here comes another one. It's rapid, rapid, rapid fire. It's like the invention of the the what the Maxim gun before World War One, right? Right. Or, and it, it's oh wait a minute. It doesn't matter that they are quickly learned to or seen to not have credibility. We're just going to inundate them. And guess what? It's working. They finally mm -hmm. found the way to um, wear down uh, people um, and any skeptics and naysayers to their narrative. And that's with this rapid fire. Um, it's amazing. The press support suggests that the press is becoming an arm of this as well. So there's a media uh, support for it. And that's mainline media, yeah. mainstream well, media, corporate media. That's in the playbook I'll be talking about in the NIMSA book. And it's all it's 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 shocking, you know. Yeah. Um, you've heard the you've heard the allegations before. What I'll be presenting is the um, historical information and thread that backs it up to show you this isn't coming out of the ether or the or crazy conspiracy theorists thinking this is this is demonstrated. <laughs> Yeah, and it gets us into the secrecy is really what's kept it all in place over yeah. these decades. What's right. fascinating, and I think what's good analysis there in that whole sweep of what's been happening, is if you go from, let's say, the SSP conference, mm -hmm. the presentations that you were doing 
uh, and you know what Farrell was doing and yeah. and that whole bit. It gets to this idea that there are trillions of dollars being siphoned out of the federal budget through secret means out the back door, mm-hmm. um, possibly using a program like COG or something, which is just completely, you know, something that people can't get their hands on. It's a black project. Yeah. And um, so if you take that type of thinking, after a while, if you have a whole group that's working around that, you're going to come to a totally different conclusion. So if you throw that off, you replace it with a kind of false... SSP narrative and you have people coming out telling stories mm-hmm. about you know encountering aliens not that that doesn't ever happen but you know right. the way that it was laid out then you go to um, what you were talking about with TTSA and them saying oh we're going to bring all this you know and there's a 50 million dollar deficit around this company and TV shows and all kinds right. of weirdness and and the founding members are CIA people yeah. And then the media is like, oh, you know what? There's a new name for this thing. It's UAP. I mean, that's pretty much, you know, quite a cycle if you look at it over the course of seven years. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 they pushed. I do think they had a hand in the pushing of the crazy, wild fantasy tales of, you know, those guys, the, the, the time jumping space commando guys. Um, and then they do a complete 180 and present to you the serious military veteran Lou and, and the serious, you know, you, uh, CIA guys and stuff like that. And right. it, they're, they're telling stories too. They're yeah. telling BS stories, right. but of, of a different nature, you know, to keep people, you know, confused. Part of it was also to divide the community even further, mm-hmm. you know, because they fed the trolling, the aggressive fanboyism. You know, that it's all, it's all part of it. Right. Well, when you think about the work that you did when you were in the military, and then if you're looking at Grush Mm -hmm. and the things that he's saying in the way that he's saying, well, you know, I'm coming out and saying this and I have this, you know, intelligence community IG that I've made this complaint to, and he's, he's doing all this kind of half step language right? and they're trying to put him through in these congressional hearings. What do you yeah. see from your military perspective when you look at a guy like that? Again, I, I, it, well, first of all, um, there's the asset analysis part. What we have is a guy who has some issues. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to say on, on the level of, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist, but you know, there, there's some uh, ego uh, mm-hmm. issues there's there's esteem issues whether it's a lack of it so an outward self-aggrandizing or um you know what have you or some neuroses whatever the case may be and for whatever the objective is in this particular thing he's the perfect guy in other words he strikes me as the type of guy that was buttered up oh you're the guy you're the one in a million who can do this for us you know whatever he was he he was an officer so what was he a captain major i can't remember what his rank was uh, and he was in the nro first which i found interesting considering sure. the heavy duty secrecy there oh yeah yeah so so um you know uh, however he's got the theatrical background that has right. been revealed now that could say one of two things in asset you know, vetting either this is a pure act. And if you got to know the real grush, you'd go, you might find that he's an intelligent guy that knows darn, that would tell you, Hey, I'm playing a role here. You Mm -hmm. know, that, that was my assignment or he was one of the kind of people he's this outgoing wanting to be in the spotlight. And, and that's what drew him to theater, but the skills he learned, you know, serve role playing and, and on and so forth that he, he's the perfect candidate for using and handling in something like this. Um, really? So yeah. he's enjoying, I think he's enjoying being paraded around publicly and, <laughs> and all this stuff. But um, I, I, he either knows or he doesn't know that he's being used for, mm-hmm. you know, a, a, a perception management on a narrative to to feed a kind of narrative, because he clearly doesn't know anything mm-hmm. that he's insinuating mm-hmm. that he knows. So, uh, what do you think the next step is with him? They're going to put him in front of these congressional committees. Are they going to try to make him, you know, kind of the 
point person for UFO Inc. Mm, maybe that was in there. Their, I, I think that might, if that was there among their original intentions with this guy, I think he's going to fizzle out because there's been enough vocal rejection of him in the community mm-hmm. that his credibility is no, it, his, yeah. his credibility is shot already and has been, you know, uh, tarnished uh, by enough voices in the community that I think they realize, uh, this isn't the guy they tried Lou. They tried Ramirez They're they're I forget who else they tried. They're, they're, they're trying Grush. Um, when they hit on one that even guys like us go, Oh, this could be the real deal. That's the guy who they'll mm, make the new right. face. Well, As you know, there's a, there's a statement by Marco Rubio who's been driving a lot of this, you know, he got, the arrow office attached to the NDAA and he's in there with Kirsten Gillibrand. Yeah, Marco with his little hands or something. <laughs> <laughs> right. exactly. Little Marco. Little Marco. So, uh, what's fascinating though, is he's kind of right in there with what you're saying because he said, well, if you don't believe this guy, we've got about 28 other whistleblowers who've come forward to arrow and we're going to get those guys rolled out. So just you wait. Yeah, see, rapid fire, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. By golly, they're gonna sh- shoot these guys at us until one of them takes. It's quantity, not quality here. At exactly. All. Wow. Amazing. Um, Walter, I I want to kind of bring this all around to the NIMSA thing since you have this coming up and it's connected. I, I see a direct thread all the way back to that development. Um, to the UFO secrecy, the mm-hmm. split NASA secret space program directly into the UFO threat analysis. It feels like a one long thread to me. So mm-hmm. if you go right to Del Shaw, can you just give us a snapshot of who Del Shaw is and then why the name NIMSA? Charles Del Shaw was a, what we know about him is from his own story. Um, Charles Del Shaw was an immigrant from uh, pre unification Germany. Um, and he came to the United States, uh, entered through Texas, actually up through Galveston Bay. And, um, according to his own story, he was sent to the United States as, um, a, a representative or agent, so to speak, small a, not with a badge or anything like that, um, to go observe the uh, activities of a group called the Sonora Aero Club, a group, uh, another group of German immigrants who um, up near what is Yosemite National Park were um, pursuing and developing what was exotic technology of the day. And according to Del Shaw, it was flying machines. And so he came to the United States, but probably um, it was an opportunity for him to get to the United States. So that's why he took the job, mm-hmm. not that he was some dedicated NIMSA guy. Um, it was like, hey, kid, we'll send you the U.S., but you got to do this gig for us. Okay. So he goes there. He's a young man. He ends up liking these guys and really being amazed at what they're doing, according to his story. So that um, by the time the the German group at that time, Prussian group, sends one of their official military officer guys to follow up on you know what they sent Del Shao to do, Del Shao is allied to the guys of the club and the guys in the club do not like, again, Del Shao says they referred to him as that Prussian officer, the official representative from Uh. this mysterious NIMSA. Now NIMSA, according to Del Shao was this very secretive group based in Germany. There was some confusion about that for years because the acronym, which Del Shao uses the word NIMSA, it's all capital letters. It's an acronym essentially. Okay. And people over the years have tried to translate what that's about, you know, and they, they would say, Oh, the NY, it must be New York because in the airship mystery, they talk about airship investors that were in New York or in the East. And, and no, Del Shal himself says this was a German based organization, which is what led me to do a, a highly speculative attempt at having, uh, you know, coming up with what NIMSA could be. If you broke the name down. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I did with help from from um, multiple German speakers, a couple of them native. OK, because I've had my naysayers, you know, oh, you don't know what you're doing. It's like, OK, whatever. Um, <laughs> but I broke it down and I could uh, if, if I, think, I, yeah. well, I, I have your book 
right here. I'm going yeah. to see, this is what you have for it, the mission statement. Yeah. If I had to write a mission statement for NIMSA, it would be the following. NIMSA is a distinctly Prussian nationalist organization yeah. dedicated to United a unified Germany's global superiority in active pursuit of influence and exploitation of the natural resources and industry mm. of the Americas. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, and the name, there was a, an, a trick with the name, which it, uh -huh. it, like you said, it came out N Y M Z a, but there was a J there that was throwing everybody off and you were able yeah. to uh, bring it out because you were saying it was more of a verbal, uh, the yeah, way that yeah. they said it. Jagdflugzig, and my mm -hmm. pronunciation is awful, and it means the nationalist um, uh, pursuit airship office is my best translation to the English vernacular. But mm -hmm. the literal words of the 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 now here's a distinction: it's not national, it's nationalist. Mm. Okay, this was not an official government thing. This was a group of. Prussian nationalists who were pushing and were behind uh, uh, nationalists were behind the creation of the unified Germany, which led, of course, w as history goes very quickly uh, to Nazi Germany. That was yes. their, that was their wet dream. The, 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 the corporate um, fascism that, you know, well, in the 19th they, century, we don't have, it's, it's a balkanized Germany. Yeah. There's 48 States there. So they are nationalists. So it's a private, very secretive organization. So it's the 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 nationalist um, uh, hunter hunter killer mm -hmm. airship office. Now people say hunter killer. That's clunky. Um, no, U.S. Navy. If you look at the history of World War II aircraft in particular, there's. Um, I was just looking at a model kit of a U.S. Navy aircraft that's referred to as a hunter killer. It's wow. a hyphenated thing. It is a military term, hunter killer. And uh, so anyway, you, you, you do all that stuff and um, it, 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 it I, I may not be right. That might not be what it meant, but it makes it, it fits the facts the you know, the, the narrative of Del Shao, it fits the history and, you know, it fits a lot better than the New York Motor Zephyr Association. That somebody <laughs> came up with no, this. I think you opened the whole thing up with this discovery. Yeah, it sounds like an ice cream truck, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the other thing. So, um, yeah, so I, I, I tried and, uh, but it is according to the source on all of this Sonora Aero Club stuff, Del Shao himself says NIMSA is a German based organization. Now, Sesheri, as we know, when you read my books, uh, I think particularly this one, the nameless ones, he does this analysis where the acronym is like an Egyptian hieroglyph because Egyptian hieroglyphs had what three different levels they were communicating mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And it, it, he does this in-depth analysis. That's wild that um, there's, there's this overarching, even more mysterious and powerful NIMSA and their presence and control is reflected in this NIMSA that Del Shell talks about. But there you're getting into the inside baseball and those glorious weeds that I like mm -hmm. to get into. You know, yeah. it's interesting when you get into this, what he's talking about, it really resonates because there's this mystical thing that goes along with it. Because when you get into the air, you're dealing mm -hmm. with spirits of the air. Yeah. I think yeah. about Lindbergh, you know, when he's doing the transatlantic flight, he starts yeah. to hear all these voices when yeah. he's not there. Uh, so you, you have this other aspect and that gets into, when you get into the Nazi occultism, there's the same there feeling again. Yeah. There you go. Because all these guys that, that um, you can run the NIMSA thread through the other thread that connects them is their interest in the occult arts and sciences. Mm -hmm. They were into this alchemical stuff and these right. occult pursuits. So there, there is um, that level. Walter, absolutely fascinating. Stay right there and we'll go even deeper for part two of the origins of NIMSA and how it got embedded in the national security state and why the Del Shell drawings have the name Trump and the number 45 as a kind of predictive programming embedded. Part two will be available shortly at darkjournalist.com. To pre-order Walter's new book about NIMSA, please visit walterbosley.com. Join us Fridays at 8 p.m. Eastern for the Dark Journalist X series. See you soon.